Welcome to everyone, and especially our distinguished guests and their families who have come from all across the country. It is an honor to have you all here. This is an historic day and an historic event here at the University of Virginia School of Law. Before I introduce Justice Anthony M. Kennedy and David Rubenstein and invite them to begin their conversation, I want to start by talking a little bit about the two people who made this day both conceivable and possible. And these are the two people next to me, Martha and Bruce Karsh. Martha and Bruce Karsh met as students at the law school in the 1980s, and they married soon thereafter, but I will let Bruce tell you more about that. Bruce and Martha both practiced law after graduation. After clerking, Bruce at O'Melveny and Myers and Martha in private practice and at the UCLA Student Legal Services. They then both moved in new directions. Bruce co-founded Oak Tree Capital Management, where he remains co-chairman and chief investment officer. Martha co-founded the design firm of Clark and Karsh, and she joined the board of the Knowledge is Power program to support KIPP schools and became involved in a host of other organizations, including serving as a trustee on the Law School Foundation's own board. Over the course of their lives and careers, Martha and Bruce have become visionary philanthropists. They believe that education can change both the lives of individuals and the course of our nation's history. And they believe that this law school, their law school, has, can, and should continue to fulfill that dual mission. To that end, Martha and Bruce Karsh have committed $44 million to the law school. I'm going to pause. This is the largest cash gift in the history of the law school, and combined with their previous gifts to the law school, including support for the light and airy award-winning space of the Karsh Student Services Center, which all of you have been to, this gift makes Martha and Bruce the law school's first $50 million lifetime donors. Their gift is directed towards shared values at the core of both their philanthropy and the law school's mission, access, excellence, and service to the nation. This gift will support our premier scholarships, which were previously called Diller Scholarships after legendary Dean Hardy Cross Dillard, and they've now been appropriately renamed the Karsh Dillard Scholarship Program. And their gift will fu uh, is funding the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy, which we are here today to launch. Martha will talk more about the mission of the Karsh Center, but let me say that it is all about civic engagement, civil discourse in a plural society, and a commitment to democracy and the rule of law. This Karsh Center for Law and Democracy will support our faculty, faculty scholarship, and teaching on democracy and the rule of law, as well as programs like this one, under the director of Professor Micah Schwartzman, himself an expert in constitutional law, a scholar of sincerity in democratic deliberation, and an advocate for reason giving in politics and governance. I can imagine no better institution than this law school to launch such a project, such a lofty, ambitious project, and I can imagine no better time than now. Since our founding 200 years ago, the law school's mission has been to educate an increasingly diverse student body to build and lead our nation. Lawyers have always been crucial to the democratic project, and lawyers from this law school especially so. On the eve of our third century, at a moment when values of democracy and the rule of law are particularly vulnerable here and across the world, the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy renews our mission and expands it. This is a historic day then, both because of the extraordinary statement of trust and confidence that Martha and Bruce's gift demonstrates in this law school, and because of the future that their gift makes possible, both for us and for democracy writ large. It is my honor and pleasure to invite Bruce and Martha up to say a few words. First, Bruce, will you come to the podium? Thank you. 
thank you, Risa. And uh, well, first let me say that uh, my day was considerably brightened this morning when I received an email from Lou Alvarez letting me know that uh, the Princeton Review rankings are out and UVA <laughs> Law is number one in quality of life and best professors. So that was great news. And it's, it's also great to know nothing's changed since Martha and I were here all those years ago. Same, same, same was true back then. So I'm often asked, how did you get out to California? And how did you transition from law into the investment business? When I hear one of those questions, my mind automatically races back to 1979, when I was beginning my third year of law school here at UVA. I was just settling in as a notes editor of the Law Review, thinking about applying for a judicial clerkship. I had been dating a second year UVA law student for about a year by then, and I really didn't want to go too far away from Charlottesville. So I focused my efforts on the DC Court of Appeals and also applied to a few high quality judges in the neighboring circuits. But a mentor of mine told me that there was this recently newly appointed and young judge on the Ninth Circuit who was, quote, up and coming, unquote, <laughs> and, and already had a reputation among his earliest clerks as being the ideal person to work for. He collaborated with them, let the clerks write drafts of opinions, and was a deep thinker and natural born teacher. Sounded pretty attractive, I thought, even if he did live in Sacramento. <laughs> and I was able to confirm with friends at Harvard and Yale Law Schools that his reputation was very strong there as well. So I sent in an application, the only one to a judge west of the Mississippi. I figured my chances were fairly low anyway, one out of 10 at best. Imagine my surprise when I got a call at the Law Review office one day from Judge Anthony M. Kennedy. He told me that Charlottesville was a long way from California and wouldn't expect me to fly out for an interview. Instead, he just wanted to have a conversation with me. An hour later, he made me an offer, and I remember saying, Judge Kennedy, I'd be honored to be your clerk. Little did I know then how prophetic those words would actually be. But there was still the matter of this second year law student I was dating. <laughs> As a month or two passed, I decided I couldn't take the risk of leaving her 3,000 miles away. She was way too attractive <laughs> in all respects, and others were likely to intercede. <laughs> So, so I asked Martha Lubin to marry me, and fortunately she accepted. <laughs> right after I graduated, we got married, and then both worked that summer in Chicago, the big city near my hometown of St. Louis. And then we started the great adventure together, driving out to California, a place neither of us really knew and I had only visited once on a family trip to Disneyland. <laughs> Just as advertised, Judge Kennedy was a terrific person to work for and learn from. In fact, he was the first full-time boss I ever had, having gone straight to UVA Law School from Duke University. And I was curious, how could a judge on the bench for such a short time have developed, developed such a positive reputation among law students around the country. It didn't take me long to figure it out. He treated everyone very respectfully and courteously, including his assistant of many years. He spent quite a bit of time with his clerks, his employees, to help train, teen and tr to help train teach, and mentor us. He always conducted himself with the highest degree of professionalism and integrity and was a perfect gentleman to his colleagues, the other Ninth Circuit judges, whether he shared their philosophical beliefs or not. In fact, 
I remember taking particular note that the judge had developed some close personal relationships with liberal judges. <laughs> mm. Needless to say, Justice Kennedy was a tremendous role model for me and all his clerks, but never more so than when it came to his family. He showed us that what one could climb to the top of their profession and still develop an incredibly close and loving relationship with one's family. And what a terrific family Justice Kennedy has. His wife Mary and he were so welcoming to the Sacramento clerks, inviting us to their home and letting us get to know their young kids. Little did I know that I'd be fortunate to collaborate and do business with his two sons later in life. And I'll never forget Justice Kennedy's advice to me back then. The first year of marriage is the most important. Make sure to spend a lot of time with Martha, he said, and go with her and explore California. It's a beautiful state. So we did. Now before the clerkship, Martha and I had envisioned returning to Washington, D.C., the area where she grew up, or possibly back to Chicago. We both had already lined up solid job opportunities. But Justice Kennedy was right. California was, is a beautiful state. And we decided to stay and start our careers there. When I told him our decision, he said with me, he said with a particular gleam in his eye, I thought you might like it here. <laughs> I told him we were zeroing in on San Francisco, where the Ninth Circuit Courthouse was, and the city we had gotten to know best. But for some reason, Justice Kennedy urged us to consider Los Angeles. His rationale, Los Angeles was a more vibrant city back then. This was before there was a Silicon Valley. And he said, if you go down and start your law practice there, you never know what business opportunity will open up for you in a couple of years. He even named a firm that he favored, O'Melveny & Myers. Now, now here's where it gets interesting. I didn't know why or how, but Justice Kennedy seemed to assign many business cases to me for review. Maybe it was my econ degree from Duke. <laughs> and, uh, I'll never forget the first one, and he might remember it too, an antitrust lawsuit named Cox versus Star Machinery. When I started at O'Melveny in Los Angeles, I very quickly and quite naturally gravitated to the corporate and securities practice there. And then, almost right on cue, I received an offer to leave the practice of law in O'Melveny three years after joining. I agreed to become assistant to Eli Broad, the founder and chairman of California's largest home building company and one of the nation's largest insurance companies. When I called Justice Kennedy to let him know with some bit of trepidation I was leaving the practice of law, he couldn't have been more supportive or excited for me. And now when I look back on my career in business, and particularly the co-founding of Oak Tree Capital Management in 1995, I'm struck by how many of the life lessons I learned from Justice Kennedy played such a pivotal role. At the inception of Oak Tree, we compiled a list of business principles that we believed should govern all our actions. It won't surprise you to know that treating all our colleagues, all our colleagues, with respect and professionalism is foremost among them, as is operating with the highest degree of integrity and ethics. And I often find myself counseling and mentoring the younger folks in the office, reminding them how important it is to spend time with their families. So, whenever someone asks me the question about moving to California, or getting into the investment world, I really think about Justice Kennedy and that one fateful year in Sacramento. But just deflect it by saying, well, that's a long story. It's a long story. <laughs> when Dean Golubov asked Martha and me whom we should invite to inaugurate the new center, we both felt strongly that Justice Kennedy would be the perfect person both because of our personal connection to him 
and because he exemplifies all the positive virtues we had hoped to highlight and promote. I'll leave it for others to discuss at length the justice's judicial philosophy, but I'd be remiss if I didn't relate one anecdote. Justice Kennedy holds clerks reunions every five years, and Martha and I are regulars. At one particular reunion 15 years ago, the landmark gay rights case of Lawrence versus Texas had just been decided, with Justice Kennedy authoring the 5-4 opinion. Everyone in DC, and in fact around the country, was talking about this case, and the buzz among his clerks was palpable. We were all so excited and proud to be Kennedy clerks, not just due to that one decision, but because of the justices consistent and long-standing rulings promoting individual freedom and liberties. <coughs> I've been approached on more than one occasion by people who know I clerk for the justice and asked me to relay their gratitude for his service to the country. Some even want him to know that they read his eloquent words from the 2015 majority opinion in Oberfell at their weddings. How cool is that? Speaking of cool, we're incredibly fortunate to have David Rubenstein. <laughs> to, join, to, to interview the justice. I've gotten to know David well. As we served together on the Duke Board of Trustees for many years, he is the chair. Through the multitude of interactions at Duke, I've become an unabashed David Rubenstein fan. This notwithstanding that he happens to be the co-founder of the Carlisle Group, a global investment management company that competes with Oak Tree. <laughs> when I called David and asked him if he'd consider interviewing Justice Kennedy for the inauguration of the UVA Center for Law and Democracy, he simply responded, if you can get the justice down to Charlottesville, I'm in. <laughs> Needless to say, Martha and I are absolutely delighted that the justice and David are here to inaugurate the center. And now let me turn it over to Martha Lubin Karsh, whom I first met a little over 40 years ago at a happy hour right over, I don't know where anymore, there, probably there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. So, before I address this particular event, which we're thrilled about, I was thinking about where we're all sitting. And I want to share a couple of comments from a man whose extraordinary leadership in the legal world and his affection and support for this law school spans more than 80 years. His name not only caps the prestigious law firm of Kaplan and Drysdale, but also, fittingly, adorns this very auditorium. I speak, of course, of Mortimer, Mortimer Kaplan, the 102-year-old Virginia grad and law alum extraordinaire. When we announced our gift to launch the Center for Law and Democracy, he sent us a remarkable letter in which he said, with the wisdom of ages, the center's aim to advance the values of law and democracy has never been more vital to help preserve our nation's fundamental freedoms and institutions than now. He added, it is all the more meaningful that the center will be housed at the University of Virginia and its school of law, which in the 85 years of my affiliation have sought to promote public service and civic engagement and to help protect our nation's core principles 
by educating generations of students to fulfill its mission. Certainly important words from a very important leader. And turning to the events of today, I too want to join Bruce in thanking David, our longtime friend and, as you probably all know, superstar interviewer of folks like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Tim Cook, and today, Justice Anthony Kennedy. David has inspired Bruce and me over the years, both with his boundless generosity and visionary patriotic philanthropy and his inimitable wit, and also his brain, which operates at the speed of light, as you will see momentarily. I also share Bruce's sentiments about Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy, you have been a beacon of wisdom, jurisprudence, and leadership on the national and international stage for so many years. But before all that, you were a wise and kind personal influencer for two fledgling lawyers in their early 20s, newly married and eager to chart their course. 38 years ago, you welcomed us to California and into your home and family. You shooed Bruce out of the office on the weekends so we could explore the nooks and crannies of California. And you helped guide us to careers, family, home, philanthropy, that all of which we cherish. And in a lovely parallel, we embrace your home state, even as you and Mary moved to my Virginia hometown when you were <laughs> elevated to the Supreme Court. As we grew, we watched and we rejoiced at your successes, your prominence on the court, your rigorous, scholarly, thoughtful opinions, your momentous decisions, all resonated and all made us so proud. We also shared family pictures, holiday cards, stories of mock Shakespearean trials, a mutual love of architecture, and we joined you at reunions and birthdays at the Supreme Court, a building that never fails to take my breath away, and in Colonial Williamsburg and elsewhere. Always an honor to spend time with you. You very graciously accepted our invitation to be the inaugural speaker for our new Center for Law and Democracy here at Virginia. As a double Wahoo and former university guide and fierce with a fierce belief in the promise of America's democracy and in the safeguards of constitutional law, I can imagine no, nothing more fitting here in Charlottesville, which just a year ago faced down haters with hoods at a university conceived and designed by Thomas Jefferson, a founding father and author of the Declaration of Independence. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson was, like you, Justice Kennedy, a Renaissance man. He revered classical architecture, scholarly education, and service to country. And like you, he believed in democratic principles, things like freedom and equal justice, the rule of law, and respect and dignity for individuals. Thomas Jefferson embraced fundamental values and big ideas, informed always by integrity and fidelity to the truth. In fact, his quote has become the tagline for our center. Quote, honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. In all this are echoes of our center's mission and vision, high-level scholarship, civil discourse, civic engagement, integrity and respect for the rule of law, a democracy both plural and collaborative. Our vision echoes in Senator John McCain's resident, resonant valediction, celebrating, quote, a life of service to a country made of ideals whose continued success is the hope of the world. I can think of no one better to speak today than a man whose life, too, has been dedicated to these ideals. And before I turn the program over to David, it's my honor and pleasure 
to announce today publicly that our gift to Virginia Law School will include the endowment of a new professorship. It will be known as the Justice Anthony M. Kennedy Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law, a chair which shall, by, its term, by the terms of our gift agreement, be awarded, and I quote, to an eminent scholar of constitutional law who possesses a love of teaching and models the integrity, civility, and fidelity to freedom and the rule of law of Justice Kennedy and his predecessor, Justice Lewis Powell, both individuals of impeccable character and among the most distinguished jurists in this country's history. We're confident that this professorship will reinforce and enhance the values and mission of the Karsh Center now and perpetuate them far into the future. Justice Kennedy, we thank you for your service to our nation, to our judiciary, and for your deep and enduring impact on our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then Bruce, you are not only generous and visionary, but you have beautiful, beautiful words, and, uh, and we all appreciate them. Bruce and Martha have already uh, touched on the remarkable lives and careers of both David Rubenstein and Justice Kennedy, so I will supplement them only briefly so that we can get uh, to the interview. Uh, David first. As Bruce said, David is co-founder and executive chairman of the Carlisle Group. He had a long and illustrious legal career before that, graduating from Duke University and the University of Chicago School of Law. We will forgive him for both of those affiliations. He's here now, after all. Uh, he moved between private practice and service in the federal government, serving uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee and as presidential advisor in the Carter administration. David's day job, as you've heard, is only the beginning of what makes him so remarkable. You've already heard about his legendary interviewing prowess, and we'll see it momentarily. He is equally well known, as Martha indicated, for his philanthropy and his engagement in nonprofits all across the country. He attended law school, in fact, in response to John F. Kennedy's exhortation, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. His answer to that question has been resounding. His embrace of patriotic philanthropy, which has led him to the leadership of organizations like the Brookings and Smithsonian's institutions, as well as the preservation of the foundational documents of and monuments to our democracy. We are delighted and honored that he brings his convictions and his commitment to today's event. It is entirely fitting, and we thank you for being here, David. Finally, our guest of honor, Justice Anthony M. Kennedy, last but never least. <laughs> Justice Kennedy attended Stanford University and the Harvard Law School. We'll forgive him, too. Uh, <laughs> he started off his career as a sole practitioner and grew at that into a firm in his hometown of Sacramento. He spent 25 years teaching at the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law, Constitutional Law. He began while in private practice and continued for long after he entered uh, public service on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in 1975. He was confirmed at age 38, which made him at the time the youngest federal appellate judge and still one of the youngest ever. He was on that court until 1988 when President Reagan appointed him to the U.S. Supreme Court and he was confirmed unanimously. Just this past <laughs> summer... <laughs> Quite a feat. Just this past summer, uh, he uh, took senior status as a federal judge after 30 years on the Supreme Court and 43 years as a federal judge. He has received so many honors and awards, and I won't mention them so we can get to the interview, but there is one I would like to mention, which is that in 2003, this law school uh, and Monticello, uh, under the leadership of Dean John Jeffries, uh, awarded Justice Kennedy the Thomas Jefferson Medal in Law, which is the highest honor this university uh, awards to anyone. We are so delighted uh, to welcome him back and to strengthen our relationship with him through the new 
Anthony M. Kennedy Distinguished Professorship. Justice Kennedy has been called a model of civility, judicial temperament, and kindness. He has been called a judge of great vision. That vision is uniquely his. It is always a vision with one looking to the past and one eye out for the future. It is a past of precedent, tradition, and the core principles and values of democracy. And the future he sees is one that requires evolution and growth in order to vindicate those principles in the service of human freedom and dignity. He is ever evaluating not only what the law is, but what the law should be. It is hard to overstate the enormous influence that Justice Kennedy has had on the Supreme Court and American constitutional law. It is simply the case that our Constitution would not be as we understand it to be in the 20th and 21st century without him. Beyond the United States, Justice Kennedy has been an ambassador for democracy and the rule of law all across the world. His stalwart advocacy of such values recognizes their contingency and their frailty. It requires us to, re to, they require our fealty and our active support to survive and flourish. Justice Kennedy has said, quote, democracy is something that you must learn each generation. It has to be taught. We are ready to learn from you today, Justice Kennedy, as we have in the past, and we are ready through the great and coming work of the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy to continue to teach those values in the years to come. Thank you and welcome. Thank you.